There's another prayer that this person made. Say, Dear Lord, so far this year I've done well. Have you? Only 10 hours. I haven't gossiped, I haven't lost my temper, I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed, and from then on, I'm probably going to need a lot of help. We do need a lot of help, isn't it, in our lives? We can't do a lot of things on our own. So the final prayer that the clip gave to us is that we are not alone. It's so beautiful and powerful. You know, New Year's Day always brings an opportunity for a new beginning. And uh, the text that I want to share with you this morning is Deuteronomy chapter 11. It is, for the children of Israel, it had been a long journey. Moses had led them all the way from Egypt through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, and now they were encamped on the eastern bank of Jordan, overlooking the Promised Land. They've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. The road is actually quite near, but because of their disobedience, and not trusting God, therefore they wander in the desert for 40 years until the entire generation that left Egypt all died in the desert. Only Joshua and Caleb managed to enter the promised land. So Deuteronomy is known as the second law. He records the sermons that Moses preached to his people before he went up on Mount Nebo, viewed the promised land. Moses didn't get to enter the promised land. Viewed the promised land, and then he died. So Deuteronomy means second law. We have a second giving of the law, or rather a new expounding of it to the new generation. It's the same law, but it's a new way of expounding it to the new generation of Israel who had grown up in the wilderness and were needing to have the law repeated because the first generation, their parents, all died. So they are the ones that have, don't have the first experience in that sense. Many people say, a lot of your Christian faith don't last three generations as well, isn't it? If you are a third generation Christian, you are in a very dangerous zone in a sense. Deuteronomy is not the giving of a new law, but an expli explication of that which was already given. So in the aftermath of his death, the children of Israel went on into the promised land and possessed it. So Moses was giving them, telling them what to expect when you enter the promised land. So he reminded them of a few things. And along the wilderness route, there were often times when there were those who wrung their hands and doubted that they could go and wish they were back in Egypt. So Moses continued to remind them that God brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land of which he has swore to our fathers. And so before the blessing of the promised land becomes a reality to his faithful followers, Moses challenges them with these words recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Gave them some encouragement, gave them some support. Tell them what to expect, what you must do in order that you may be able to really dwell in this promised them land. So he reminds them that as they cross over to their promised possession, God is going to watch over them and guide them. And so I think as we stand at the brink of a new year, or rather we are already in 2023, our hearts are filled with anticipation and challenge of what to expect this year. Only God knows what the future holds, but the possibilities are limitless and partly or mostly depending on how we respond to all that comes along our way. So I want to give you uh, four points from this passage. I want to encourage you that as we enter into this new year, just as God, Moses encouraged the people of Israel as they entered the promised land with these words. So the first thing that I want to encourage you is that 
of God's provision for you in 2023. God's provision for you in the year 2023. I don't mean only in terms of finance, finance side of it. I don't mean just that. Uh, but God's provision can be in a lot of capacity, in a lot of ways. Uh, because we all don't just have physical needs, we have emotional needs, we have mental needs, we have spiritual needs. But I often lament that most of us, energy most often concentrate on our physical needs. We don't take too much into account of emotional needs and mental needs that we need to take care of. And this is what Moses said to the people of Israel before they entered the promised land. He said, the land you are entering to take over is not going to be like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot as in a vegetable garden. But the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. So Moses first and foremost reminded the people that the land that they were about to possess was a land of hills and valley, mountains and valleys. Mountains and valleys. And this summarizes up all our lives, isn't it? We have mountaintop experience. We also have valleys that we go through. That is called life. Did you know that in the word life, L-I-F-E, there's a word within that word? You know what is the word within that word? If. So life is pretty iffy, they call it, isn't it? It's unpredictable, it's uncertain. Anything can happen. Sickness, someone went astray, someone died, someone taken away from us, someone abandoned us, someone rejected us, business failed, there's so many things that can happen. Uh, it is a land of hills and valleys. There are desert places in the Judean wilderness, and then there's a beauty oasis of Jericho. It did not take the children of Israel long to discover that it was indeed a land of hills and valleys. They began their conquest. You are familiar with Joshua. Those who have studied KYB, we went through the book of Joshua. They began their conquest of the promised land with a great victory at Jericho, only to descend into the valley of defeat of I in the days that come afterward. And so the same is true for us along our journeys. Ours too is a journey of hills and valleys. Thank God for the hills, the mountains, because often in the valleys we forget about the mountains. And unfortunately, often when we are on the mountain, we forget about the valleys that would be no, because there, if there's no valleys, there would be no mountain tops. We never learn spiritual lessons on the mountain. They are always learned in the valley where we are trusting, depending on the living God to get us through. Mountains are there to enlarge our vision, to let us see our potential, to give us a spirit of conquest. But in the valleys, that's where we become more like our Lord. We would not choose the valleys, but His ways are not our ways. He is, in fact, the good, the God of the mountains. He's also the God of the valleys. So I want to, you to notice these words. When, when Moses said to the people that the land they're entering is going to be a land of mountains and valleys. And then he also talked about the provision. Drinks rain from where? From heaven. It is not, as he said, planted your own seed and irrigated it by food as in a vegetable garden. But when you enter into the promised land, the mountains and valley, those places, the drinks rain from heaven. That is, he provides us he provides for us supernaturally. For the children of Israel, the land of Israel was quite a conquest from the past years, quite a great contrast from the past years of Egypt. And Moses reminds them that the land they were about to possess was not like the land of Egypt. 
where you sow your seed and water it by food, but it's going to be a supernatural provision by God. You know, the land of Egypt depended on human resources. There was not much rain, the Nile was their source, and it overflowed once a year. Therefore, hard work was involved. By hand and by foot, they dug trenches, canals to irrigate the land. In Egypt, it was all done by human effort. Work was their motto. But in Egypt, there was no need for God. Water was stored by artificial means, and fields were irrigated by human sweat and toil. Egypt did not depend on God like Canaan did, but when they entered the promised land, they are going to really depend on the Lord. And here, Moses promised them that God is going to rain down from heaven during the mountains and the valleys that we go through in life. There's this prayer that someone make in the new year. May God make your year a happy one, not by shielding you from your, all your sorrows and pains, but by strengthening you to bear it as it comes. Not by making your path easy, but by making you sturdy to travel any path. Not by taking hardships from you, but by taking fear from your heart. Not by granting you unbroken sunshine, but by keeping your face bright even in the shadows. Not by making your life always pleasant, but by showing you when people and their causes need you most. And by making you anxious to be there to help. God's love, peace, hope, and joy to you for the year ahead. I thought that's a very balanced, beautiful prayer. Uh, of mountains as well as valleys. Too many times our prayer is always God shielding us from any uh, danger or any problems in life, but it is not uh, that more rounded biblical prayer. It's that whatever that we may go through, that God will always sustain us and give us the strength because it is through those kind of circumstances that we are drawn nearer, closer to the Lord and grow spiritually, emotionally, and mentally as well. So, that is as we cross over to the new year, we do so with the assurance that the same God who sends us the autumn rains of the past will send us the spring rains in the future. It may be a land of hills and rains and and all that in valleys, but it is also a land that drinks rain from heaven. God will supernaturally come and provide for the resources that we need to go through 2023. Number two is God's presence. Moses assured the people of Israel as they enter into the promised land, not just only of God's provision, but also God's presence is going to be with them. God's presence. Verse 12 tells us that. It is a land that the Lord your God cares for. Yeah, I'm going to give you a promise. It's a a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, God writes the gospel not in the Bible alone, but on trees and flowers and clouds and stars as well. The whole creation, it is work. His presence engulfs the entire creation. Or Max Lucado said, God's presence is, is, is his presence. His greatest gift is himself. So we, in, some, in one sense, we cannot attain the presence of God. We are already totally in the presence of God. What's missing is awareness. What's missing is aware that God is always with us. God is always with us. Someone say that when you are safe, it's not the absence of danger, but it really is the presence of the Lord. It's not the absence of danger, but it is the presence of the Lord. And don't 
miss out verse 12 that say, It is a land the Lord your God cares for. It is a verse that we often overlook, this, per, this pronoun. Moses refers to the God of Israel as your God. It is a personal Lord and Savior. We are in covenant with Him. We are His and He is ours. Moses reminds his people that this is true from the beginning of the year to its end. So as we cross over into a new year, we are reminded that God is watching us and that His eyes are upon us. God's presence with you. Recently, I conducted a funeral and after that, I spent some time with uh, the family and the wife mentioned to us that at the final stage of her husband's death, throughout his time in his illness and facing death, he never uttered this word. Only until the final day before he died. He said, I'm very fearful. I'm very scared. I'm very fearful. For some reason, when we approach the final end of our life, I've heard so many times where you suddenly feel all alone. And it is when Psalms 23 that brings us the comfort that that final journey that no one can journey with you, even the closest one that loves you the most can stay by your bedside. But inwardly, there will be this vacuum of aloneness. That God can say, even though you walk through the valley of death, I will be with you. I will be with you. And maybe when we come to that final end, we, we, you and I, we cannot imagine because we are not there yet. We are not there yet. We have never experienced that yet. The aloneness is so loud. The loneliness, the agonizing loneliness of the final hour is very scary. And it is such time that God's presence with us is extremely comforting. God's presence is going to be with you 2023. God knows you. There's a story about this man, this student, he, first year student, studied this subject called ornithology. Ornithology is a branch of zoology that concerns the study of birds. I have absolutely no interest in that, uh, but there are people who love birds and all that. And having studied the first year, went for the exams, and to his surprise, all that he needs, the exam was 25 pictures on the wall. Just 25 pictures on the wall. And they are not photos of birds in the color, but pictures of birds' feet. And so the test is to identify the birds just by looking at the birds' feet. And so this student studied so hard of all the theory and all that about birds, was very angry and frustrated. Said, this is ridiculous. You can't test us like that. And so the professor said, well, unless you answer those questions, you're going to fail. He said, I'm not going to answer. I, I'm walking out. He said, if you are walking out, you'll fail. Tell me your name. And then he removed his shoe and pulled out. He said, Tell, you, you find out my name yourself. <laughs> Well, this is just a humorous story to illustrate that, but God knows you. God knows you, all right? God knows you because He made you and He created you. Many children make the mistake as they grow up, they think that their parents don't understand them. They have forgotten that they look after them <laughs> for many years. They have forgotten that. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, Yes, for the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. So you have God's provisions. You have God's presence. And the third one that I want to give to you is God's promise. 
God's promise. John Piper, one American uh, pastor, said one of the greatest enemies of hope is forgetting God's promises. One of the great enemies of hope is forgetting God's promises. Promises are important. Remember, promiser, God is the promiser. I mean, you, can, you may not trust your tradesman or your accountant or a lawyer or whatever, but remember who is the promiser. And so John Piper was right, I think. One of the great enemies of hope is forgetting God's promises. So don't forget God's promises to you throughout the scripture. When you forget his promises, you will lose hope. You will lose hope when you forget God's promises. As we age, the Bible verses become, you know, so familiar to you. You know all these verses. You can quote since you're young, Sunday school. It doesn't mean much to you anymore. But the minute you forget those verses, you will kill off your hope when you confront with difficult times in your life. Because God's promise will sustain you. God's no, God's answer no to you is not a rejection. It is a redirection. When God say no, it is not a rejection. It is to redirect you to his pathway. And so this is what Moses said to the people of Israel. So if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in a season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. This is God's promise. But you, you realize that it's a conditional promise in a sense, because there's an if there. If you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today, and then verse 4, then I will send now. So it's a conditioner in the sense that you have to do your part, your bit. Some promises in the Bible are unconditional. Some promises are, are conditional. There's no doubt about that in the scripture. As I often say, unconditional love doesn't mean unconditional approval. You can unconditionally love your children, but doesn't mean to say you approve everything they do. So this approval doesn't necessarily mean that you don't love the person. Sometimes the most compassionate way, compassionate thing to do is to say no. And that is love. So unconditional love doesn't equal unconditional approval. Especially in this relativistic culture that we live in about, you know, uh, uh, just sentimentalizing what love is all about that it means that you must always give in all the time. No, no, no. Unconditional love is not unconditional approval. Every parent will know that. So the, note the promise is conditional in the sense that it begins with if, and then verse 14, it begins with then. This promise is not for everyone. It is for whom? For those who love the Lord their God and serve Him with all their heart and soul. And then God is going to rain down your land in a season, both autumn and spring rain, so that you may gather in your grain and you will have new grass in the fields for your cattle and you will eat and be satisfied. God does not give us everything we want, but he does fulfill his promises, leading us along the best and straightest paths to himself. So their primary purpose, isn't it? So Moses is saying to the people, your primary purpose is to love God, to focus on Him. Give your heart, put Him first in your life, and then the rest will take care of itself. The rest will take care of itself when your number one priority is God. C.S. Lewis once said this, when, what, when I have to learn to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. He went on to say, in so far as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, 
I shall be moving towards a state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed but increased. The more we... Pro- That's right, sorry. When the first things are put first, second things are not suppressed but increased. Meaning to say, when you, do, when you put the first thing first, you get the second thing as well. But when you put the second things first, you get neither. You get neither. When you put the first thing first, you get the second things as a free gift given to you. But if you put the second things first, you get neither. And so if we put God first and love Him with all our heart, all our soul, the rest will take care of Himself by itself. The rest will take care of itself when we put God first. God's promise is that when we do our part, You know, God promised Noah that if he would obey and trust him, God would keep Noah and his family safe in the boat. God did not say he would take Noah out of the flood, but he did promise to bring Noah safely through it. Not out of it, but through it. And so all this debate about tribulations and the the tribulation of Christian not having to go through it. For me, I, I'm a post-tribulationist position that I believe the Christian will all go through the tribulation. Uh, and the rapture will only happen after the tribulation and not before. Because in the story of Noah as well, that God bring us through the flood and not out of the flood in a sense. He did promise Noah safely through it. You know, at times as though we are drowning in a flood of troubles and problems weigh us down, I hope you remember God's promise. I hope you will turn your attention back to God and rededicate your life to Him. Put Him first and then your perspective will be right. Your attitude will be right. The rest of the things will come into place when we put God first. God's promise. Don't forget His promise. When you forget His promise, you will lose hope. You will lose hope when you forget God's promises. Lastly, God's protection. Lord's, God's protection is a long passage from verses 16 to 25. God's protection, the safest place in all the world is in the will of God. The safest place in all the world is in the will of God. Moses said this to the people, be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. I think that is very, very pertinent in our time because there are so many distractions. There are just too many distractions in our lives. And even as a pastor, I get distracted about what I need to do. Can you believe that? I get distracted of what I need to do. The main thing must be the main thing. Because it's the main thing. As they say, the main thing is to put the main thing, the main things. So the main thing is to put the main thing, the main things. And we need to put the main thing, the main thing. Otherwise, we will be enticed and led away. Our heart will go down other pathway. Be careful, Moses warned, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. And then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain and the ground will you no produce. And you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. They literally do that, right? Jewish people, you know, they literally do that. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that the days and the days of his children may be many in the land. The Lord swore to give your ancestors as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. If you carefully observe all these commands I'm giving you to follow, to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, and to hold fast to Him, 
Then the Lord will drive up all these nations before you, and you will dispossess nations larger and stronger than you. Every place where you set your foot will be yours. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon, from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you. The Lord your God, as He promised you, will put the terror and fear of you on the whole land, wherever you go. And the condition is always to put God first and to trust Him and to love Him with all our hearts. And then let the Lord do the rest. The battles belong to the Lord. The battles belong to the Lord. So as we enter this new year, I trust that God will protect you, will watch over you every step of your way. We too need God's provision because to depend on human effort is sheer folly. Some of the things, some of the emotional needs, mental needs, spiritual needs can only come from God. Those things money can't buy. God's provision you will need God's presence. There will be times when we, like children of Israel, wonder where God is. When we go through challenges in our lives, sickness, people abandon us, rejected us, business fail, alone, lonely. God's presence, His eyes are upon us. We cross over with God's promise. There may be times that this is all we have to hold. This may be the times that there is all that we can hold on to to keep our hope alive. And that is God's promise. And lastly, we go this year, 2023, with God's protection. There may be times when we'll be without help or hope unless God supernaturally intervenes and protect us. So I hope you remember these four things as you enter 2023. Trust in God's provision, His presence, hang on to His promises, hang on to His promises. That is your hope. And then trust in His protection. This morning, just like most of us here, you receive lots of texts. Yeah? Happy New Year, Blessed New Year. Some nice, some photo, some forwarded 20 times. Still you receive 20 times. Uh, and, and one I received, that I received before past year, was a pastor standing up, leading his congregation, singing a hymn. And the hymn is, Another year is dawning, dear Father, let it be. In working or in waiting, Another year for thee. Another year of progress, another year of praise, another year of proving thy presence all the days. Another year of mercies, of faithfulness and grace. Another year of gladness, the glory of thy face. Another year of leaning upon thy loving breast. Another year of trusting, of quiet, happy rest. Another year of service, a weakness for thy love, another year of training for holier work above, another year of dawning, dear Father, let it be, on earth or else in heaven, another year for thee. May this year be a blessed year that you experience God's provision, presence, His promises, and His protection. Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you, we come naked before you. We come with nothing under the foot of the cross. You are the one that clothes us. You are the one that gives us all that we need. We need you more than we care to admit. As we grow old, as we age, our body falls apart. As we grow, as we see things in different anger, the fragility of life, the vulnerability of life. Dear Lord, we need you more. We are returning closer to our Creator. We want to worship and honor Thee. 
Lord, this year, we don't know what we'll bring forth. We don't know. But we want to look back 2022 and we can acknowledge that your grace is sufficient for all of us. And so as we enter 2023 humbly, in uncertain times, we trust in you. You promise to be with us. You promise to provide for us. You promise to protect us. And so we humbly bow and thank you. Help us never to lose sight of you. Help us to love you with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. And we find our truest freedom when we are slaves to you. Thank you, Lord. As we sing this closing song, a reminder that you are our shepherd. You will lead us through another year of your grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, your good God. We worship you. We thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.